I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. Canada's battle against COVID-19 was a bag of mixed results this weekend. Ontario set another daily record with 3,945 new infections, and Quebec added 2,588, while provinces farther east posted far fewer, if any at all. Despite the statistical differences, the country's top doctor says disease activity remains widespread. Dr. Teresa Tam says vaccines will eventually help gain lasting control, but until then, an all-Canadian effort is needed to keep COVID-19 at bay. Meanwhile, COVID-19's devastating impact on a long-term care home in Toronto was the focus of a rally to press the Ontario government to do more to protect seniors from the potentially deadly illness. Two federal party leaders took part in yesterday's demonstration at the St. George Care Community Home. Green Party leader Anne Amy Paul and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. 43 residents and 28 staff members are currently infected with the virus, while 14 deaths have been linked to the outbreak. Ottawa is looking to counter the threat posed by white supremacists and other right-wing organizations. They are calling for the federal government to ban the right-wing group Proud Boys over its role in last week's deadly mob assault on Capitol Hill. Founded by Canadian Gavin McKines, the Proud Boys is a right-wing group that is unapologetically misogynist and increasingly linked to white supremacy and hate. Canada is at a crossroads with its mission in Iraq, more than six years after Canadian troops were first deployed to the Middle East to fight the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Hundreds of Canadian Armed Forces personnel remain in the region. The, with the current mission slated to end on March 31st, officials must decide if troops will stay. Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan has recently declined to say whether the mission would be extended. Canada is condemning last week's mass arrest of politicians and pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Foreign Affairs Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne and his American, British and Australian counterparts say they have serious concern about the arrests. They say Hong Kong's national security law is actually being used to crack down on dissent and opposing political views. Canada's agriculture minister has pledged to work with the incoming U.S. administration to further strengthen the bilateral agricultural trading relationship between Canada and the United States. In a statement released by her office, Minister Marie Claude Bebeau says that a strong Canada-U.S. agricultural partnership is, quote, a commitment to support jobs and families, strengthen our economies, and make us more competitive in the global market. The president of an Inuit women's organization says the COVID-19 death of a Nunavut woman who contracted COVID-19 after flying to Winnipeg to deliver her baby points to the challenges expectant mothers face in the territory. Rebecca Jude Lowe says the death of Sila Tekkavik is an example of the urgent need for midwives and access to birthing services in Nunavut. Ms. Kudlo says Inuit women should not have to leave their homes and support circles to give birth. Indigenous leaders are saying roll up your sleeves as First Nations across the country start getting the COVID-19 shot this week. Six of 14 New Channel First Nations on Vancouver Island were priority recipients of doses of Moderna's vaccine last week. One tribal council official says health officials also need to work with communities to ensure the COVID-19 vaccination program is culturally appropriate. The CBC's multitude of broadcasting licenses are up for review today at the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission. The CRTC says electronic hearings have begun and first heard from the public broadcaster itself. There is also a long list of interveners, 70 in all, scheduled to begin presentations and continue over eight days until January 26th. The federal Liberals are in the crosshairs over a lack of new safety rules for East Coast offshore oil workers. A pair of conservative shadow ministers say Ottawa should bring in permanent health and safety regulations. Senator David Wells, who represents Newfoundland and Labrador, is also joining the push. The criticism stems from transitional regulations, which expired on January 1st, leaving offshore workers in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador in limbo. A human rights tribunal has ordered a police force west of Toronto to pay $35,000 in damages four years after two officers handcuffed a six-year-old black girl at her school and held her on her stomach for nearly half an hour. The Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario says the Peel Regional Police Board has until mid-February to pay the girl's mother in trust for counselling fees and injury to dignity, feelings and self-respect. 
Don't go away. This past week, we learned a class action lawsuit is in the works against porn giant MindGeek. MindGeek, which is headquartered in Montreal, Quebec, is the largest adult entertainment operator in the world. Recently, a New York Times expose revealed that porn site Pornhub had been uploading content related to sex trafficking victims and underaged kids, leading the site to delete millions of videos on its platform, the majority of its content. We spoke more with independent senator for Quebec, Ms. Julie Miville de Chen. More on this after the break. Last month, a New York Times expose revealed that porn site Pornhub had been uploading content related to sex trafficking victims and underaged kids, leading the site to delete millions of videos on its platform, the majority of its content. But Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, which is headquartered in Montreal, Quebec, is the largest adult entertainment operator in the world, with multiple porn sites that haven't been investigated as thoroughly. Meanwhile, a class action lawsuit has been filed in Ontario against MindGeek, claiming that the site has has been benefiting from child pornography and non-consensual content since 2007. Independent Senator for Quebec, Ms. Julie Miville de Chen, introduced a bill earlier last year that would make it a criminal offense to not verify the age of users before they enter an adult site, called Bill S-203. Senator Miville de Chen joins us now on Forum Daily. Ma'am, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, you have been pushing for Bill S-203 even before the New York Times expose was released. So what led to the creation of this bill and why is it needed at this time, ma'am? Well, because there's absolutely nothing to protect children, teens, uh, to exposure to porn on online. Nothing. So you can be a kid, you can just click on Pornhub, for example, they will ask you, are you 18? You answer yes, and they will let you in like that with absolutely no age verification. Well, for me, this was unacceptable because as you know, in real life, if you want to go to an 18 plus movie, you need to show an identity card if you want to go in a porn shop you do that too porn is an adult industry so how come our kids and the average age is 11 year old for a kid to be um, exposed to porn so that's pretty young so how come our kids have absolutely no barrier to go on porn sites there's Pornhub the biggest but there's about 4 million porn sites around the world. So it's dangerous. Uh, a lot of scientific studies have shown that there are links between uh, children watching porn and some harms like uh, becoming a cons compulsive con consumer, um, having the potential of being more aggressive, uh, how they see uh, gender uh, women, because porn nowadays is not what it used to be. It's hardcore, it's often violent, it's degrading for women. I've been on, on those sides for my research. And really, uh, yes, it's adult entertainment, but when children see that, it can be really, um, uh, really complicated for them. And, and there's no reason why they should have access to it. Now, we know that MindGeek is the parent company of multiple porn sites. So has there been any further investigation into sites other than Pornhub to see if they host similar videos related to sex abuse, sex trafficking and rape, ma'am? Well, not that I know of. And so that's why it's so interesting that the New York Times did this very thorough investigation on the biggest, you know, Pornhub is the biggest porn site. So, and also it's not only the New York Times, for one year, um, Californian women named Leila Michael Wilt um, did a campaign uh, on the web with petitions being signed uh, against Pornhub and she found all kinds of stuff that was illegal and we also have on Pornhub young women and families that have complained and cases that have become public of minors being being uh, seen on Pornhub in sexual exploitation activities so it's 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 very um, for me it was a wake-up call. Uh, MindGeek is in Montreal, like 
not far from my home. And there's no reason why uh, they shouldn't be um, looked at very, very seriously. And our extra responsibility is that it's a Canadian uh, company, obviously, with LinkedIn, Luxembourg and everywhere, but it's based in Canada. And I think we have an extra responsibility not to accept that it shows uh, sexual exploitation of children and non-consensual sex, too. And we know that Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbo is set to introduce legislation around removing illegal content online. Um, So what do we know so far about this upcoming legislation, ma'am? And we've got about 30 seconds left. So this was another result, I would say, of the New York Times article. The minister was working on it, but he was uh, inside to go faster because of all the scandals. So it would be a regulator, Canadian regulator, who would slap fines uh, that could be in the millions to digital platforms who would not take off illegal material. So Facebook, Twitter, but also I hope porn sites, and they would have to be much more quick and to to, to take away to the, the material that's illegal, like sexual exploitation, but also hate speech, violent content. So it's, it's a very wide uh, bill. We haven't seen it yet. Some long-term care workers in southeastern Ontario received the region's first doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine yesterday as part of the province-wide vaccination campaign. The Kingston Health Sciences Centre joins regions like Windsor-Essex, Toronto, Peel and York regions in the long-term care vaccination program. This comes as the province continues to face criticism in its handling of outbreaks in care homes. In a CBC interview, Natalie Mara from the Ontario Health Coalition said the province needs to come up with a strategy to prevent more long-term care deaths, which involves hiring more staff and bringing in the military, regardless of a vaccine or not. Meanwhile, new modeling from yesterday shows that 40% of Ontario long-term care facilities have COVID-19 outbreaks, with forecasts predicting that there will be more deaths in long-term care during the second wave of the pandemic than during the first. Well, to talk more on the long-term care situation in Ontario, we are joined by Dr. Bob Bell, Ontario's former Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you for joining us on the show, sir. Thank you for inviting me, Nima. Now, let's start by talking about what exactly is happening in long-term care homes at this time during the second wave. Can you paint a picture for our viewers? Well, certainly the most important optimistic thing that's happening is that vaccination is proceeding extremely well, both for long-term care staff and long-term care residents. Uh, You know, I've heard through colleagues that uh, long-term care homes in the Toronto region, uh, many of them have completed vaccination. The long-term care homes that are assigned to my old hospital University Health Network, I understand that the first dose of vaccination has been given to residents who've provided consent for treatment to staff members who've uh, wanted to have vaccine administered. And of course, this is terrific news because uh, after the first dose of Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine, uh, there's a substantial amount of immunity confirmed. It does require a second dose, of course, but we're on the way to seeing our, you know, our parents, our grandparents being protected in Ontario's long-term care sector. And that's great news. Um, certainly the concern is that up to 40% of Ontario long-term care homes now have an outbreak. They have one or more patients uh, who have uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19. And that remains a concern. Our long-term care homes have been hot spots of infection across the province. And why do you think that long-term care is being hit even harder during the second wave? Some would think that we would have learned lessons from the first wave. Well, you know, I'm not sure it's been hit harder during the second wave. If we go back to April, uh, substantial numbers of people were uh, were infected with COVID-19 in long-term care. And tragically, uh, many Ontarians lost loved ones in the long-term care sector. As we all know, up to 80% of mortality across this country that's occurred as a result of COVID-19 has occurred in long-term care residents. And that's nothing but a tragedy. Uh, Some things have improved during the second wave. There's certainly been more access to personal protective equipment. 
this province has led the country in offering workers, in fact, in insisting on that workers in long-term care have initially every second week a COVID-19 test to ensure that they weren't carrying COVID-19 asymptomatically into homes that's been stepped up in hot zones in the province to twice a week during the second wave. So I think we have learned some lessons. I think the, the issue of the long-term weakness of Ontario's long-term care system in terms of staffing especially has been an element that's been a real concern to people who care about long-term care. And I think that's something that requires a long-term fix for long-term care. And to add to that, I want to go back to Ms. Mira's comments. So she's saying to hire more staff and bring in the military. Is this the right solution, sir? And we've got about a minute left, sir. Thank you. Well, certainly there's no question that having more staffing in long-term care is a solution. And the government's committed to four hours of staffing. That would, of course, require us to hire more staff to provide that staffing. Uh, but that's over a three-year time horizon. That doesn't help right now. Uh, certainly the time to recruit more people for long-term care to provide the extra care necessary because of COVID-19. Time to do that would have been during the summertime. And right now it's pretty hard to train new staff and recruit new staff who are willing to work in long-term care when there's such concern about this being a focus for COVID-19. All right, Dr. Bob Bell, again, thank you so much for giving us your time on the show today. Thank you, Nima. This past week, in our look at top stories from around the world, a team of WHO specialists arrived in China to investigate the origins of COVID-19, and Twitter CEO defended his move to remove the president from the platform. The WHO team of international researchers that arrived in the central city of Wuhan, China, hopes to find clues to the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic. The search for the origin is likely to be a years-long effort that could help prevent future pandemics. Scientists initially suspected the virus came from wild animals sold in the Wuhan market. The market has since been largely ruled out, but it could provide hints to how the virus spread so widely. The U.S. House has impeached President Donald Trump, again, making him the first U.S. president to be impeached twice. Still, it remains unclear when the Senate will proceed with a trial. Ten Republicans joined House Democrats in voting for the impeachment. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey broke his silence with a Twitter threat, defending his company's ban of U.S. President Donald Trump as the right decision, although he warned that it could set a dangerous precedent. Mr. Dorsey said that the company faced an extraordinarily un and untenable circumstance with respect to public safety after the Capitol riot and said he thought this was the right decision for Twitter. But such bans, he said, also point up Twitter's failure to create an open and healthy space for what Mr. Dorsey calls the global public conversation. Conversation. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Kelly Kraft has met virtually with Taiwan's president after her in-person trip was canceled. The meeting sparked criticism from Beijing as China considers Taiwan a renegade province. It has recently ramped up threats to bring the island back under its control. Police in Hong Kong have arrested a lawyer and 10 others on suspicion of helping 12 Hong Kong activists try to flee the city. The fresh wave of arrests comes a week after 55 activists were apprehended in the largest move against Hong Kong's democracy movement since Beijing imposed a new national security law last June. Critics fear that the expanding clampdown is a signal that China is asserting more control over the city, breaking a promise following Britain's handover in 1997 to maintain separate civil rights and political systems. Ugandans are voting in a presidential election tainted by widespread violence that some fear could escalate as security forces try to stop supporters of leading opposition challenger Bobby Wine from monitoring police polling stations. Yuweri Museveni seeks a sixth term against a strong challenge from the young singer and lawmaker who has captured the imagination of many across Africa. The government has shut down internet access and the military is on the streets of the capital. The country has never witnessed a peaceful handover of power since independence. 
Three United Nations peacekeepers died and six more were wounded in northern Mali hours after the UN's top officials expressed cautious optimism of an election in March 2022. The UN peacekeeping mission in Mali said the peacekeeper's vehicle struck an improvised explosive device on Wednesday and the soldiers came under attack by unidentified gunmen in the Timbuktu region. The mission says the attackers fled the scene and medical evacuations were carried out by helicopters. State media says Iran has fired cruise missiles as part of a naval drill in the Gulf of Oman amid heightened tensions with the U.S. Images released by the military showed the missiles being launched and hitting their targets. The drill began Wednesday when the country's navy inaugurated its largest military vessel. The exercise takes place amid heightened tensions over its nuclear program and a U.S. pressure campaign against the Islamic Republic. The Mexican government says it and 10 other countries are worried about the health risk of COVID-19 among migrants without proper documents. The statement issued by the 11-member Regional Conference of Migration suggests that Mexico and Central America could continue to turn back migrants, citing the risk of the pandemic. Over the last year, Mexico, Guatemala and Honduras have turned back or stopped migrant caravans seeking to reach the U.S. border. Mexico has also stressed the need to improve conditions in southern Mexico and Central America so people won't feel forced to emigrate. The European Union's Food and Safety Agency now says worms are safe to eat. The Parma-based agency published a scientific opinion yesterday on the safety of dried yellow mealworms and gave them a thumbs up. Researchers said that the worms, either eaten whole or in powdered form, are a protein-rich snack or ingredient for other foods. Katie Keurig will become the first woman ever to host Jeopardy when she serves a guest stint in place of the late Alex Trebek. The show announced yesterday that the journalist and former Today Show host will be among those guest hosting on an interim basis. Mr. Trebek, the face of the show for 36 years, died from pancreatic cancer on November 8th, and his final show aired on Friday. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news from this past week. Remember, for more news on demand, you can head over to our website, thenewsforum.ca. And if you would like to stay in the know, feel free to follow us on all our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check us out on our YouTube channel. Stay tuned for other programs on our network, including commentary shows on economics, politics, Canadian law, and social issues that affect all Canadians. See you next time on the Forum Daily Week in Review. Take care.